Hello and welcome to Monday's episode of a Terrace Scottish Football Podcast. I am your host Craig Fowler and I am joined in person in my flat in deepest, darkest gorbals by Craig Anderson. Hello, how are you doing? I'm good. And by Tom Watt. Hello, how are we doing? I'm good, I'm good. Excellent. Tom, it's very brave of you to turn up after your team was gubbed 6-0 just down the road the other day. You know, I'm a, I'm a trooper. I like to think of that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very brave. <laughs> very brave, very brave. Or... Very brave indeed. Very brave, yes. Well done. Well done. Thanks for... It's not the first time in recent history. I know, I was going to say, at least, it wasn't, like a... at least the, the six <laughs> wasn't turned up upside down. Uh, like, been here before. You wouldn't be able to get most of his uh, on the podcast uh, ever if it was about not coming on when your team have been embarrassed. <laughs> that's like uh, that's like par for the course. Yeah, especially if it's getting embarrassed at Celtic Park. There's a good few times in my recent memory that I'd like not to remember. I remember one time, actually, it was my birthday. It was actually my 21st. I had a very good night the night before at the Murrayfield Rugby Club, and then, which also had my 30th at because I am nothing but lazy and can't be bothered finding new places to go. Same people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was re- 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 the invite. It's really awkward when I invited my first girlfriend by mistake, yeah. Uh, no, and the next day, me and a few pals went to Celtic Park, thinking, oh, well, we could probably get a result. You know, it's my birthday. We'd actually... The season before, I think we'd won. Yeah, we won there. And we actually won our next trip to Celtic Park that season. Not so much on my birthday. Got beat 5 0. I think we left when it was still three. Well, we went, I, we played them on my birthday one, I think maybe my 18th birthday, and we spoiled Flag Day. We had a 0 0 draw. So that was all right. Uh, more or less the last time we ever got a point there. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, I think it was a, it was a definitely a birthday. I think it was maybe my like 27th or 28th birthday. I was going to have like a big, a whole bunch of boys were coming down from Aberdeen. We were going to go to, uh, New Douglas Park and go uh, Hamilton, who were terrible that season. No, Kelsey Priest. Every season, yeah. And um, all the trains were off about when I was about. Tw- I'd been in the grounds for about twenty minutes because I went early. So I spent the birth my birthday on my own, and it was minus five, and we lost two 0 Tremendous, lovely stuff. Which <laughs> thus concludes my worst game, my worst birthday game. Let's actually, why do we actually begin with that game? I wasn't going to do it initially, but it is something quite interesting about Celtic's 6-0 victory over Aberdeen, which is the Aberdeen aspect of it. I think it's fair to say Celtic and Rangers just both winning this past weekend. Both doing it, v- very different kind of shades of comfort, but both doing it in, in very comfortable fashion. So not that entirely interesting from a title race perspective. However, from the perspective of what's happening with Aberdeen right now, it just seems like it, it's a very... It's weird because it's hard to describe Aberdeen's season as a roller coaster because you're still like what, ninth or tenth of the table. Yeah, but you're you have done. I mean, results haven't been there, but performances in Europe have been good, and you're in the final of the League Cup. But it just feels like it. Just like for every step forward, there's like two steps backwards this season under Robson. Um, I think no. I think for every step forward, there's a step back. It's just it's just it's one. Just, it's just, just one. It's it's gone. It's gone nowhere. There's been lots of encouraging performances. There's been some fantastic performances, especially in Europe. There's been a couple, like there's been two in the league. And I think the frustrating thing is, it's, it feels like the squad's the best squad we've had in, in a really long time. And, and from the European performances especially, there looked like there was a blueprint for how to play. But that, it, that was like a throwback to the bad old days. Because the... the the best part of what Robson's been able to do since he's come in is like minimise mistakes. Largely minimises mistakes. Not been too good at forcing mistakes on other teams. It's largely been you know a flash of inspiration from somebody. And that's been the problem this season is that a couple of the players that were kind of the go-tos to make things happen haven't, haven't been there, haven't, uh, haven't turned it on. And I think that for me, the biggest problem with it is after the games, after bad performances and there have been a few this season Barry Robson's been quite good at going this is what the problem was in that game and some, sometimes it's really obvious like they all look absolutely knackered that's within your power to control though and the idea and, and I, I, I don't I, I, in theory going to Celtic Park and, and playing the same way as you did setting up the same way as you did against Frankfurt setting up the same way as you did against Pau Kowei with like this nine men behind the ball one runner that's going to occupy the strikers. In theory, that's a really interesting way to play. But if the team's tired, that's far harder 
than actually going and having a go and having runners and, you know, maybe the ball will stick and maybe he'll have a spell of pressure. Well, is that the big problem with Aberdeen this season is that there's money spent, a lot of money spent in the summer because you saw the blueprint last year with Hearts and it was kind of similar with Hearts as well, although Hearts were using their, their players that they bought a bit more, they just weren't any good. But Aberdeen have brought in a few guys to make sure that the team's not always so tired, like that you can handle the rigours of playing on Thursday and playing on Sunday. The only problem is Robson only trusts about 13 of them. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. It's I think there's fifteen or sixteen, but it's strictly fifteen or sixteen. And there are and and to an outsider, it's frustrating because there's a whole bunch of players that are on the bench or not in the squad who could do a really good job at you know in the league are are tried and tested or have played at a level that's you know consistent with being well a, a higher level than 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 they would be recall, uh, required for in the league. So I think the frustration is there was a squad that was built and yeah, he would have liked another couple of bodies and yeah, it's a little bit unbalanced and it's not necessarily set up to dramatically change the system if needed. But there are still the, you know, there's still Esther Sockler, Vin- Vinnie Busejan. We've seen fleeting bit. We've not seen any of Reese Williams or Daddy has played at international level with, with, with Israel. We've not seen anything of him. And if so, if the idea is that the players are knackered, and they did look knackered, like they did, they did look absolutely knackered. And I will buy the excuse to some extent that being really tired after that game and the pout game, they did run themselves into the ground. All of that's true, but it's within your control to do something about that and and freshen the squad up a bit and and you know use the use the resources that you've got a little bit better. Craig, go to you for the kind of the, 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 I don't know why the go to you for the Celtic point of view, but yeah, like yeah. L- l- <laughs> looking yeah, at the you know we Craig with an H in my name. <laughs> 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 looking at the champions in this one, I think the the biggest thing from them is just the fact that Lewis Palmer continues to look very good. He got a goal and I think three assists for this one, and Yang uh, was one of the kind of star performers in this one. He was somebody that at the start of the campaign did look quite sharp and thought oh, he could be a decent signing and then kind of you did wonder whether he was one of these guys that just kind of looked good but didn't really provide anything but that's him now got a goal and when I was looking at the I was preparing doing the team of the week for the SPFL I had a look at Kerry Dale Street Kerry Dale Street's always really good for that because they always have that every after every single game they've got the who was the man of the match and it's always three players so it's always like a good easy selection like if I need a Celtic player I can put them in any part of the team almost but I saw that Yang was consistently mentioned amongst all them. So now he seems to be not just somebody that's been a bit tricky to defenders, is also coming up with an end product as well. Yeah, and I think what what they have, and they were talking about Rangers and their lack of attacking options, Celtic have a plethora of guys in those front positions. So you, you see O, who I'm not the biggest fan of, comes on and scores a couple of goals as well. He'll go going off, obviously, they lose a big player, but they've got so many attacking players. Palma probably wasn't a starter at the start of the season. He's not one of the ones you would have had down as well, obviously it wasn't because they didn't have him then, but you know what I mean. They wouldn't have had him down as like a, a starting player, but he is really looking very good. And the assist for the fifth goal is incredible. The outside of the foot cross, it's um it's, it's superb. And they're doing that in such a way that you talked about Aberdeen's lack of rotation. Rogers definitely trusts all of those attacking players to, to play. He's even, you know, given James Forrest the odd start. It hasn't gone that well, but they've been... He really thinks it's James Forrest of 2016, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Got to keep, keep cool. Plug away. Plug away. You never know. <laughs> but, um, so they, um, yeah, they have a lot of really good options and, and Yang's one who I think they'll probably be looking at and think they can ease him in because yeah, he's, he's that, young and he's um, that is the big thing though you talk about Yang you talk about oh that was like what we we're saying about Celtic just a few weeks ago was that they're, they're lacking the the quality to bring off the bench and if these guys can actually provide something then that's a that's a huge advantage to Celtic when it comes to the, the title race because it does seem like that there might actually be a title race yeah, now yeah. I think everybody was just assuming that it was going to be a, a cakewalk because Rangers were absolutely dreadful under Michael Beale but as we'll come on to, to talk to later in the show they they have been improved under Philippe Clement and it does look like they're they're going to to end up being a, a tougher out for Celtic and where you would see Celtic dropping points was the fact that in games where it wasn't working for them early in the campaign it just looked like they had so little in order to change it but if O can O's blown hot and cold O, o at time for me has looked exactly what Celtic have needed 
and then other times he's just really not done much. This was a game where he kind of like he's a different option off the bench that they need. He's the he's a bigger guy. He's a very different type of player to Kyogo. He gets his goals. He's, he seems to be a decent enough goal scorer. And then there's but at the same time, I still wonder. He does seem like a still a fairly big downgrade on Jack and Marcus, and that's up to him to to kind of prove otherwise. Still, I would say. Yeah, he's 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 got. A lot of that. They need a player like that. They need someone who's a bit more physical, etc. But yeah, he's not. I, I was saying to you, like a lot of the goals he seems to score are exactly that. Well, they're like already three and four nil up, and that I mean that's okay. But it, they don't really. They're, they're not the goals you remember when you're thinking about any title that you win. It's like the it's the last minute winners and the you know goals like that. It's the Mark Birchall goal for Celtic, the, the, the fifth or the sixth in a five or six nil win. <laughs> Right, okay, let's move for that one to... Let's move to a game that was another hammering, but was, again, interesting. And that was Dundee 4, St Mirren 0, taking place at Dens Park, where... I mean, it said a lot about both teams. One, it kind of underlined Dundee's surprising competence to begin the Scottish Premiership season. But also, St Mirren having rescued a point against Hibs, and I, I said on the podcast I've done with Joel the Patreon, if you'd like to listen to that, patreon.com forward slash terrace podcast, you can, make, you can hear me sound like a bit of an idiot. I said that I thought that was huge for St Mirren, because if they could go and get a positive result at Dundee, then that really kind of shows to themselves that they are a proper team to be reckoned with in the, in the battle for third place. I know they've already got it, but it's still an early part of the campaign. Hearts, Hibs and Aberdeen have really got off to slow starts. And if they could have followed that up with a, a, a result... They're, they're third, but they're... In a more traditional sense, there's six points from ten. <laughs> <laughs> or something. So yeah, that was aye, thank you, Tom. I was kinda of going in circles there, but that's kind of what saved sorry, that's what's worrying about St. Mirren. I've got my I've got my theories on this. Um, because I'm a little bit like the the band in the Titanic when it comes to St. Mirren, I, I think this season. So I'll go to you guys first. Tom, I'll go to you. What do you think, St. Mirren? Right, first St. Mirren, is this them showing their true colours? Or was this just a particularly bad day at the office? I, I think for the moment, it was a bad day at the office because the things that went wrong... So, like, they, they have, they've built a really strong start to the season on... like They're really hard to beat. They're really hard running. They do the basics really well. They defend set pieces really well. They don't tend to give runners... They close down runners. They, they, they're, they're a hard-running, hard-working team. Here, they conceded two goals to corners... And two on the counter that they were, um, they were, they, they had them, they had more men back by playing a ridiculously high line and chasing a game that was already done. Mm. So, in the sense that it wasn't like, it didn't look like they downed tools. It didn't look like they, there was anything like fundamentally broke. There was just all the mistakes that you might expect to happen in four or five games all seemed to happen in, uh, in one at once. And there wasn't that sense of you know, this, this one's... They were, they, were chasing it, they were chasing a game too hard that they were just didn't have any chance of, of winning at that point. I think there's, their form is stuttered a little bit, but I'm not sure that's especially surprising given the, the run that they, they had um, it, it, in the first instance. And St. Mirren, as good as they've been in the last kind of calendar year or so at home have been pretty atrocious away from home better this season yes but still it's hardly a glowing glowing record away from home whereas Dundee yeah the four goals are a, a big surprise but they've got a really good home record and they seem like a much more cohesive unit that uh, than I thought they seem to have turned up a couple of bargains in the transfer window and um, look of of all the teams that are there or thereabouts, they actually look like they're not just there by luck or bad luck. They actually look like they kind of know what they're doing. Well, we'll talk a little bit about Dundee in a second, but I'll go to you, Craig. Craig, does this what does this say about St. Mirren's candidacy or third uh, place? I I don't think they're. I think they. I think even they. I think even Stephen Robinson wouldn't have put them down as favourites for third, even when they were sitting quite a few points clear. I think it shows up like they are clearly a good team and they've got good players, but they they probably were playing above themselves for much of the start of the season. Like they were getting a tune out of guys that's beyond what you would really expect those players to be doing. Um, and then when some of the mistakes start creeping in, like Richard Taylor's not a player I really rate particularly highly, but he started to look a wee bit shaky. Zach Hemming probably 
you could question for a couple of goals, you know that he's kind of got that in him as well at this level. Those players who clearly have something about them, but we are just cons- consistently being excellent. And it's natural for that to drop off. I don't think it's something they have to worry about in terms of their season. I've got another question for you. Do you believe, how much do you buying into the, they were ill, they had an illness, a sickness bug throughout the team? I think they said it before the game, but I, I question that in general as like, it's, it's a very easy excuse to fall back on afterwards. Like there probably were some, one or two players, but. Um, Richard Taylor in that first half certainly looked like there was something wrong with him. I don't, I, I, I don't know. They, they made a quadruple sub at half time, which is, um, is maybe telling, but I, I, you, you, these things happen through a season and I think when that happens you, you just try and kill a game maybe and, and get a nil nil or whatever. But I, I don't I don't think they're getting to worry about it. I think they're still strong contenders for a top half finish, but I think it's natural when a team is really playing miles better than they should be that they're gonna start losing some games. I I still believe a lot more in St. Murren than I think the majority of people will. So St. Murren will not finish third. I still, I still think they'll finish third. I'm, I'm going, I'm, I said it before, and I'm going down with this shit. Can I make a rash bet again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not eating enemy's tubes, Tom. I'm not eating enemy's tubes. Hmm. I know, some men won't finish third. What have you got in mind? A uh, hundred pounds of charity of your choice. <laughs> no, fuck off! <laughs> Money where matters. I, I think, I think some men will finish in the top six. I don't think they'll finish third. I don't think they'll get European football. I think there's there's a they are they've they've started the season really well and they are a really cohesive unit but all it really takes at this stage and and it's fun but all it really takes at this stage for is for anyone to put three wins together and i don't see them necessarily being the sort of team that's going to be able to put four or five wins together because they're away form still got question marks over it i think they'll probably lose Kenny back is certainly in january i think that's a hard if they're still, if they're still, I, I said this earlier the season where people were saying like they'll lose players in January or whatever. If they're still in the battle for third place in January, like serious in the battle, they won't sell anybody in January because so it'll, just think, be, it'll just be far too much money to them. Otherwise, they're not like if they sell Keanu back, is what they're going to get? Hundred fifty thousand? If you're lucky, well, they'll get more. Well, they they turned down more than that last summer. Yeah, but they, they're, they're, he's, he's out of contract next summer, so it's there unless he's going to be like right, I'm just going to down tools. Like there's no, there's absolutely no reason to sell so, him because like, they could get about four million pounds otherwise. Generally speaking, third needs about 60 points. This season is probably going to be 50. 50, 50, high, 50 to 55. St. <laughs> Mirren will not get 50. Right. 50. So let me say that their recent run, so that the, the poor run, quote unquote. So they drew at Killy, not a bad result. They were beaten by Rangers. They beat St. Johnson. They got beat by Celtic. In a, in a close game as well, where they nearly got a point. They drew with Hibs. Again, not a bad result. Even the Hibs at home. Hibs are generally better away from home than they are at Easter Road. And then this is the bad result. But there's an international break ki- coming up. They got the chance to write themselves. They get, uh, apparently, uh, Jonah Ayunga could even be back for the Livingston game. Then they've got Livingston at home, Ross County away. They play Rangers, not ideal. But then they're away to St. Johnson, home to Ross County, home to Motherwell. They're not going to get 40 points from those four games, so that's what they're going to need. <laughs> but then they'll continue. Then they're going to Tyne Castle. They're going to have to at some point. They're, they're going, going to Tyne Castle, December 23rd. They'll, fr- they'll frustrate the life at hearts and they'll get something there as well. They're away from home. They're, uh, no. I, I, I think credit where, you know, huge credit where it's due. I think they've, I think they've, they've been a breath of fresh air in some ways of the way they played, but I think Craig's point's absolutely valid in that there are, there are too many players in that squad, for me, who are playing two levels above what we've seen them do before. Well, then we'll continue to do so, Tom. Craig, before we move on, Dundee... 100 pounds on it. No, no. You heard it here first, people. I need odds. 100 pounds. I need odds. I can't just have St. Mirren or the field. Well, 100 pounds if I win goes to... If St. Mirren fails... If St. Mirren uh, finish third, I'll give you 100 pounds to the charity of your choice. If they don't, and somebody else finishes third, then... Uh, the opposite's true. No, yeah, I mean, no, that, that's no, but not that. an evens bet. That's no, not, not an evens bet. It's no, not. right, Craig. Not that much confidence in Merton fans. Before we move on, Dundee, an excellent performance. Back Yoko, a couple of goals, which I was particularly pleased to see because he's somebody I quite like watching. He's somebody that's very much a handful for opposing defences, and it just hasn't really worked for him in terms of luck so far in front of goal this season. But also Zach Rudden, with I think well, a lot of Dundee fans were saying his best game for them. I think he saw that that chance that he missed near the start of the game was perfect kind of Zach Rudden like it was like 
exactly what I saw from him in the season of the championship where he terrorised the defender. He, he bumps Taylor off the ball quite easily, gets himself into a position. And that's what Zach Rudden's good at. That's when I saw him play in the championship, I thought this this guy's got it. He's definitely got a chance in the premiership. We've obviously not seen that. and He's, he's had a chance. Well, no, I was going to say... <laughs> <laughs> We've not seen it in his first spell at Dundee, his loan spell at St Johnston or anything else, but he may be starting to kind of turn. And he's very much, I think, the thing with Doherty is his teams are very much on the mckinnis Doherty prototype. They play in a very similar way, and that type of forward is always going to get chances because he's going to be an absolute nuisance for defenders constantly. And beyond that, they've got quality around about them. And they... Well, a good goalkeeper, they've got a very strong defence. It's five clean sheets and six. Like, that's the type of team who does well in this league, and I don't really see them that stopping again. Like, 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 um, like they're not going to be pumping teams four 0 at home every no. week again, and they're not going to be keeping five clean sheets out of six all the time. <laughs> but they are such a much better team than Dundee have been since the Paul Hartley team that came up in that very first season. I think that's the last time they were they were anywhere near this good. Right, let's move on to our next fixture, and I should have really written it on another, so I'm just kind of doing this on the fly. Just Ross County, I'm not doing think I'm ready to talk about that game yet, that was absolutely disgusting. Let's go <laughs> to the game at, let's go to the game at Fur Park, actually. Let's go to Motherwell against Hearts. I watched this one until Hearts went two goals ahead, and then I didn't, uh, didn't really have time to watch the rest. Obviously, I didn't watch it live. That was I was recovering on Saturday. I'd planned to watch it live on Saturday, and then Friday night really got away from me. So I ended up having to just watch it back, uh, as opposed to watching it at the time. I think, from a Hearts perspective, first half was very impressive. It was like pretty much domination from Stephen Aismith's men. It was one of the better performances I think I've seen so far this season. The, the they used the width of the pitch really well, knocked the ball about well, had. The fact that they kind of had Cochrane hugging one touchline, Forrest hugging the other, it meant like they kind of there was a lot of space to knock the ball around. I thought Alex Lowry in the first half was was pretty good in terms of using that space and didn't always come off for him, but he was at the very least someone who caused problems and was central to a lot of good things Hearts did. Benny Beningame had his best game, well, probably since he, well, I was going to say the season, but it would be since he got injured, really. And he looked. Not, I wouldn't say quite approaching his best yet, but certainly hope that he, that, that is a level he can get back at. And it was just very comfortable in the first 45. It was like, mother old. I don't know why. Well, I'll just continue talking about Hearts. Yeah, I'll, I'll finish talking about Hearts. Second half, mother will put them under a little bit of pressure in the first 15. And then there was, uh, I, I don't know if it was actually shown on sports scene. I don't think it maybe was. It was Brody Spencer had a chance where he was kind of played in on the left and he had the opportunity, he had three options. He could have gone straight for goal, he could have tried to slip in Beerith, who would have had a decent chance like try to shoot on the turn from kind of inside the six-yard box, or he could have laid it across for Blair Spittle running in. He decided instead to just flick the ball with outside his foot straight to Hearts player. And <laughs> Spittle's reaction is brilliant. He goes, absolutely fucking rash, he's <laughs> furious. And at that point, because he'd ran away for Forrest and Forrest was just sleeping. At that point, Naismith immediately hooked Forrest off, brought Civic on, and right away, because it was Spencer that was causing the issues at the start of the second half, right away, Muller really didn't do anything again. And the second goal was coming. Nicely worked goal with Beningamy's through ball for, for Shanklin. And Shanklin get two goals. That's him for 10 already this season. There's a lot of chat earlier in the campaign, like, oh, but Shanklin, in terms of like he'd fallen off for performances last season. and... And I mean, I, even I was saying like he wasn't playing necessarily that well and maybe he should be taken out of the team. That was probably to be bollocks because he's, when, around the bit of the time I was saying that is when he's got back on the goal trail and he's, as usual, his goals have been absolutely massive for hearts and he does look like he's starting to put in the performances again to, to kind of match the goals. And back in the Scotland squad today. And back in the Scotland squad today. Not that I think he should play not as a Scotland but, fan. Not, but he's, uh, he's, you can see why he... He would pick him because he's starting to develop his all round game a lot more. It was something that we spoke about in this bit last season, who they're maybe kind of the two that are kind of fighting it out for that fourth choice striker spot at this point. But the he's starting to develop a lot more of an all round game. I think that pathetic spell at Dundee United, not pathetic on his part when Mickey Mellon yes. was like deliberately keeping him as far away from the goal as possible, is maybe even that didn't stop him scoring from like 70 <laughs> yards. But he's uh, it's kind of probably helped his all round game to the point where now you can see him. 
he's he's both the best striker and the best playmaker at Hearts, which is um, quite an achievement. Motherwell. Yeah. They're pish. They really are. Um, it's so weird, like, how much, like, how quickly things in football change. A- absolutely. That's what I was going to say. So, I mean, no, it wasn't, what was it, like, what, six or seven games ago, they're, I like, know, like, these are completely arbitrary measurements, but if you'd gone from the point where Stuart Kettle was, uh, was appointed to six or seven games ago, only Celtic had more points in that period, and it was by about four points. Ridiculous run of form. And I, there were there were so many question marks at the start of the season. For me, there was so many question marks about the recruitment. How do you replace a 30-goal season striker? That squad doesn't look like it's got an awful lot of pace. That squad looks like there's not an awful lot of dig in midfield. It looks like it will be quite easy to play football against them. And for six games, I ate my words. But I've spewed those words back up now <laughs> because all of those things are now proving to be true again. I've heard this yeah. recently, Tom. You need, you need to stick with your convictions, especially in Scottish top flight, because it just goes like yeah, that all the goes. time. So it, 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 they they don't they don't look like they're going to fashion a goal, other than from opponents making mistakes. They are so easy to play against, to like play football mm. against. It's not like it, it's not like there's it's not like the lack of running or anything like that. But there just seems to be. Any time I've watched anybody playing Motherwell in the last couple of weeks, and you know, for a couple of weeks ago, it was so easy to play one touch, two touch football against them and easily take out four players with a couple of passes, and and that seems bizarre given what they were, what they they were hard to play against. Not exactly just, steel men, are they? Not exactly steel men. Barely even. Oh dear. Anything yeah, yeah. like <laughs> can you think of a soft metallic substance? <laughs> Barely even in a Tin form men. of base metal, aluminium foil. <laughs> I say excellent, but I mean, you talked about Van Veen. It's not jotting that down as a possible name for the show. <laughs> it's not. It's not just about Van Veen. They they, they lost uh, Max Johnston as yeah. well, who was a big part of that resurgence last season. Him coming into the team, he uh, he obviously went off to Austria, and so you've. You've lost two pretty crucial players and they also, I can't remember the guy's name, the fullback they had on loan from down south and the other side was reasonably all right as well. And that may even have been after last season, but they, they had, uh, was it QPR or some some pathetic English club? But um, <laughs> but they, they've they've not been able to bring in quality and I think you saw in the attack, obviously Beareth's a, a, good, a good forward yep. player or yep. at least he, he's got signs of being a good finisher and maybe they'll end up hanging their hat on him. But when it's a lone player, you're always... Talk about James Furlow? Yeah, that's the one. Yes. Yeah, he was he was quite good. You're hanging your hat on um, uh, Loney is always risky because they can get the you can get the rug pulled out from you in January as well. And since he started starting games, it's, it's not he's not been as effective. So there's just lots of little things from Motherwell that are starting to not go well. I, I personally think they should back Kettlewell to turn it around because I think he's he's quite a pragmatic manager and I think he'll find the right way, but you can understand the clubs pulling the trigger. The the problem well the problem with both Kettlewell turning it around in the in the short term and a new man turning it around in the short term is the fact that the basically or well, Kettlewell signed the players to fit his the system and now the system is no longer working. So like an easy option would say, okay, right, let's ditch the ditch the three at the back, stick Calm Butcher at defensive midfield, make ourselves slattery as one of the players in front of him. We'll maybe say Spittle, make it a bit tougher. Who the hell is sticking out wide? No any wingers. So now they've they've got an endless supply of youngsters, mother away. There will be some like <laughs> fucking four million pound player in their youth team. Again. They were they were minging in the first half in this game in particular. They were really, really poor. Like the, the tactic seemed to be so the play basically played three four three. Blair Spittle was stuck out in the left. That was wild. And but it didn't really matter anyway because the tactic was to bypass the midfield and go long to the front three, get up to them as much as possible. And Hearts just dealt with absolutely everything. Like, well, first off, Theo Bear and Connor Wilkinson aren't any good. So that was a piece of piss for Kingsley and Rills. And Beareth is the only decent option up there and Frankie Kent just handled him perfectly so it was just the ball just kept coming back constantly there was nothing else to their game second half like I say they bring on Spencer move Spittle back to central they're, they're a better side take off Bear as well but it was just still 
like other than that 50 minutes, they then just soon kind of just seemed to run out of ideas. And that was at a time where the, the team make a bit more sense, but they just had so little confidence going that it was just, they were just, uh, they were just dreadful. Uh, they're, they're definitely a team that should be worrying at the moment, I think. But also, as we said with St Mirren, and teams not winning every single game, teams do not lose every single game no. either. I think the, the, the biggest worry for Motherwell and a handful of other teams is for a couple for a couple of months, it looked like there was going to be one side kind of cast adrift and it was going to be who's playing for the playoff place. It do, now does look like it's another who's going to be there, who's going to just be like when the music Musical stops, chairs, yeah. yeah, who's going to be left sitting there and <laughs> you don't want to be in that position. Well, actually, that's a pretty good link. So I wasn't going to go to this game initially, but let's go on to two teams who could find themselves sitting in that chair when the music stops. St. Johnson versus Ross County. St. Johnson won Ross County nil. I watched this. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, told me, you told me specifically not to, Craig. I not. watched this so you don't have to, so you guys didn't have to, so none of you, nobody, nobody watched this. The first half was absolutely atrocious. Like, the worst 45 minutes of football I've easily seen this season. Uh, the ball, it was like the ball was accidentally kicked into a dodgems at the fairground, and it was just pinging around with no rhyme or reason. That's quite good fun. <laughs> <laughs> he, he nobody did. had control of it. Like, if I say nobody had control of it, I don't even mean like no team had control of it. I mean, like, no player had control of it. <laughs> it was shocking. There was twice in the space of a minute where a Ross County player tried to make a pass to somebody near the touchline, and both times it passed out for a throw in, but each time it was it the was exact same. They just passed out. Like, the guy getting there just didn't get there in time. It was the exact same thing that happened twice in the space of a minute. And I was immediately, and that was like within the first five, and I, immediately I was like, Oh, this is going to be terrible, isn't it? And oh, yeah, the first half. I mean, the second half wasn't much better, but it was better. Yeah, it was a, it was a dreadful, dreadful game of football. But I think, Craig, I mean, Craig Levine, to me, was a very astute appointment for that squad that St. Johnston have got because Craig Levine is very good at making a, a silk purse out of a so's ear. He is very good at basically taking shit players and just playing shit football with them in such a way that it's effective and he's done it multiple times in the past and he's also good at legacy building like there's a lot of things that, that like if you talk about St Johnston and the fact they lack structure bringing in Craig Levine almost gives them like a guy who is going to have an eye on the bigger picture as well and I think he's I think it's I'm a big fan of him in general and there's, there's criticisms that people can have of him quite rightly and his transfer record at hearts and that last spell was abysmal, but he is, I think they, they've made the best possible appointment to, well, I mean, best possible appointment within their budget to give them a chance of staying up. And we've already seen it pay off because they, they probably should have won in midweek. And then they, they did indeed get the win, win in this one. And he will not let them go on a big losing run. And that might be enough to keep them above water. I think they, I think they are probably still. Can't go on too big a losing run because they won at Easter Road. No, exactly that. But they're they're probably still among, alongside County and Livingston. I think those are the three worst teams in the league. But they have given themselves a much bigger chance than I think we thought they had. Should we not include Motherwell in that now? I, they, they're they've still got they've just just got a wee bit more, a okay. wee bit more. Lennon Miller might return at some point. Just stuff like that that I don't think these clubs have got. But um, I I thought it was a really nice goal and obviously quite poignant for Graham Carey as well who. To be honest, not being the best of players for St. Johnston since he went there, but he looked like he had a, a pretty all right game in terms of being involved. Mm. Well, yes, good, well done. I see. <laughs> I see. No, I actually saw afterwards like a St. Johnston fan like saying he thought he had a good game. I was like, mm, I'm still not really sure about that. I thought Dan Phillips had a very good game. He was really, he was the one player. He was the one player in the first half. I was like, he's the only midfielder with a semblance of control of what's actually going on here. And then in the second half, he was even better. Like, it really did impress me. And he's, he's actually impressed me quite a lot since his initial first three, four months where he looks hopeless. But he's, he's somebody that just seems like has a real knack of popping up in the in the right areas. Luke Robinson, I thought as well, it's probably the best I've seen him play so far. I thought he was quite good, especially getting forward. Um, we'll, myself and Craig will cover his body slam of uh, Victor Latore on the, on the Patreon when it, when it comes to that as we do a, a ref review. But... Other than that, he was decent defensively and it was one of the kind of few forward players in, in, in the first half, particularly, that was actually doing something. I just kind of want to moan about Malky Mackay, though, in Ross County. I don't really know what Malky Mackay's doing. So, 
I mean, to be fair, St. John's were sitting with a, a fairly deep back line, but I looked at the teams, and you look at Simon Murray playing up front for Ross County, and you look at St. Johnson with Ryan McGowan, Liam Gordon and Andrew Considine. McGowan and Considine both over 30. Gordon, never fast. Like, that's got to be one of the slowest back threes you can ever put together. And you've got Simon Murray in the team, and there was just nothing. There was nothing in their play that meant enabled Murray to to test them and to exploit them. It was just shite. And Jan Dander, obviously a very good player. I don't know if it's tactical or if it's him, but he needs to stop popping up in like the fullback areas. He needs to get further forward and he needs to like be like roughly, he doesn't have to stay within the width of the post because he's not a centre forward, but he needs to like be ruffling that area so he can play a through ball. To set it forward to score. He's not going to do anything when he's out with left back. And he, so many times he pops up there, it makes no sense. I think maybe Malcolm McKay saw Ross County as his way back into football and has now discovered that that is his punishment. <laughs> <laughs> like they're, they're, that's your purgatory. You're going to uh, one day be sacked by Ross County for, like, because I mean, yeah, I've said it many times. He's been, he's, he's many things, but a bad football manager with a bad track record is not one of them. And in recent, in the last, Few games, it does look like the 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 sense of coherence and the sense of you know we've the ability to identify one or two things that might make a difference in a given game just don't seem to be there. The I same think, sort of enthusiasm doesn't seem to be there. I think his days are numbered actually because I think there's just a noise in general there that that's not not necessarily around any of the other clubs that are down the bottom. Like the fans don't like him, they mostly never liked him, and they're they're grim. They're a very grim team to watch. Like there's nothing enjoyable about Ross County, and there there wasn't Even last the, season the, either. The, to be honest, the, the flourishes when there's like odd players who seem to come in, like Yandanda, where you're like, oh, they've got a player there. There's a, and then it's like, no, you can't have the nice things. We'll leave him on the bench for a nil nil draw against St John's. They did have Eamon Brophy missing, who has played well for them, and they have looked a better team when he's in it. They did look very good. I was impressed with them in this. Yeah, against Motherwell, particularly in the second half against Motherwell. I thought they played really decent football. I thought, well, there's, there's a blueprint to go forward with. And yes, you are missing Brophy for this one, and that does affect the way you're going to play if you're going to replace him with Jordan White. But you, you, if you sign an injury-prone player, he's not going to play. Like, that's... <laughs> like, fundamentally, you can't you can't build a team around him. And they signed, they spent, allegedly, six figures on, on Jay Henderson. He's barely been seen. I like, completely yeah, forgot he was... Like, um, and, but they got... But they, they got Exactly. He must surely be injured as well because he wasn't on the bench and they didn't even fill the bench. But they got exactly what St Mirren had in Jay Henderson, which was like an inconsistent young player, but they paid money that it just simply wasn't worth. Because I think, as far as I know, we were interested in him because I think he's got connections. He's from Ayrshire, sure, I think, got connections. And then as soon as it was like, no, we'll need to pay St Mirren compensation, it's like, oh, okay, no, this project player is not worth that gamble. But, I mean, I know Ross County got the a substantial sum from, from Ross Stewart's transfer, but doesn't feel like it's been well spent either. Right, let's move on to our of my yeah penultimate penultimate game, which uh, let's go to let's go to Easter Road, shall we? For Hibs one, Kilmarnock nil. Okay, I'll just hand over to you for this one. Yeah, not not a good uh, not a good game first and foremost, but I I'm starting to worry not about our away form because. The away form was bad last season because we played badly away from home. The first few games of this season, we didn't play badly away from home. We probably should have beat Dundee. We were the better team against Motherwell. We played very well against Hearts in a 0 0 draw. Like, we, there had been some bad ones in amongst that. But as soon as I heard Derek McInnes, um, I think it was post match in the game last week against Levy, sorry, Motherwell, post match, he was like, oh, we might have to change our style to go away from home. I was like, Derek, you could have done that last season and I would have agreed with you. But this season, just keep doing what you're doing. We're a good team. We don't need to change our style away from home. If we keep playing the way we've played, I think we'll win an all right number of away matches. Like, because I think, I, I, again, you say stick to your principles. I think Kelly are a good team this season. I think we've got a strong, strong case for the top six. But sticking like four centre-backs along the line worked against mother will surprisingly well so that's okay to stick with that but then to like have five center mids in the team as well it was just like it was a team that was set up to just like turn it into a shit fest and i don't think we needed to do that against a fragile hips team yes you're without kyle vassell but we won games without him before 
And Matty Kennedy didn't have the best game against Motherwell, but he's still a live wire. And just stick your stick with your two wingers, because then it, and then it comes down to oh, well, we didn't have enough creativity. Well, well, why the fuck was that? Because they've got no creative <laughs> players on the park. Where do you think it's going to come from? Like, but it's um, so it's just these things that annoy me because I think that squad, like, just anyone. I mean, Liam Donnelly, ideally, because I, I I don't know why he got a contract. He's just just a wee bit off it. Like if. If Brad Lyons and, and Brad Lyons has surprised me this season is an upgrade on you, then you are by definition not good enough for this level. But he came into the team and was hooked at half time for Kennedy. And then Kelly just had more of the game from that point on. Yes, we're one 0 down at that point. I stretch to say we should have got a point, but we were certainly the the in the ascendancy because Hibbs naturally given their, their history of chucking away leads recently. Kind of camped in, and um, we had a very good chance from McKenzie at the end. Yeah, I, th- I think the chance. I think the crowd turned a bit on Hibs in the last twenty minutes because of just what's been happening recently yeah. with Hibs, and th- they just got naturally nervous and got kind of that nervousness then kind of manifested itself into frustration, which they took it in the team, and there's still a lot of question marks over Nick Montgomery's use of subs, and and well, in particular, like loving to chuck on. Well, it's like Louis Stevenson came on in stoppage time here. It's like you did not need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at least, at least this time we didn't just chuck on young players were either defending a lead or or trying to get a goal. Yeah, but they, they I mean, I think it was a bit of a blow because uh, Ennis Cameron got injured in the warm up or got um, we certainly couldn't play, and that meant we didn't have that physical option to come off the bench that might have made a difference at the end. But talking that, like Kelly probably didn't quite do enough in this game. But I just worry that he'll keep doing that rather than just saying do you know what we've, we've got it in as we'll win games eventually it's like it's like you have to have the mentality that yeah you've got that monkey on your back but we won games last season we will win away games this season just keep playing and, and they'll come and and it feels like it's been overthought from a hips point of view like they were all right like but they, they they weren't the attacking team that i think we've seen the kind of swashbuckling team partly probably because of what they were playing against i suppose but Definitely Campbell makes a difference in terms of just having like that energy. I quite like him as a player. He's quite limited as a footballer, but his energy is quite infectious on the rest of the team, I think. And, and he's obviously the one that gets the goal, but he he creates he just creates a wee bit of space. I think he's a wee bit um smart. He creates a bit of space for like Boyle and, and, and others. Tavares is starting to look like he might have a future at the club as well. And that was kind of a constant threat of those two in the wider areas, like because Campbell does more than some other players in terms of just his movement. It was quite a good role for Campbell because it meant that he wasn't really involved in the build-up as much. And that might seem a bit harsh to him because he did play some decent passes in the game as well. But it's Campbell's passes are always passes when the game's in front of him in the final third. When he's, it's when he has to be in the middle of the park and he has to have his wits about him and he has to be quick on the turn and you know swivel and buzzwords like that that he struggles because that's just, we saw it under Maloney when he was like, Sean Maloney's tactic was to give him the ball as number six where he's facing his own goal and the only thing Josh Campbell would do could be to give it right back to the defender again or give it away. But when he's further forward, he can use that energy and he is quite sprightly around the final third. And I think it was actually, it's still a bit of concern that he only just seems to ever want to play 4-4-2. Especially because he doesn't really have the centre midfielders to do it at this point in time and as it's been mentioned in other shows, he might not get that because properly play a 4-4-2 for a team in the Scottish top flight that's going to finish third, you need some very, very good players in there. They may have one in Joe Newell and he's been excellent this season but to, to find another one that's a bit difficult because him and Levitt... I, I think the problem with Newell is you don't know which type of player to pair him with because he's in between, he's kind of a mm. mix of both of the types of midfielders you want in, in a two. That's true, yeah. Because like, do you play him with Jago or like a Jago better, better Jago, like a, a Brad Lyons type midfielder? Um, <laughs> but they, uh, but they, uh, like, he, he's maybe not quite good enough as an attacker to, to cope with that. And if you play him with a Levitt, he's maybe not quite a good enough defender. Yeah. To, to, so there, he is maybe a wee bit caught between stools there, but yeah, a good player he certainly is. But he did make an adjustment in terms of playing Martin Boyle through the middle. And I think that's maybe the first time he's done that, Montgomery, that he's either played Boyle or Yuan through the middle. Because I, I said that after after Tuesday's game I couldn't believe that he, when they're trying to show up the lead instead of bringing on well instead of putting Yuan up front he brings on a youngster up front instead like just stick Yuan up front like Yuan's possibly even better up front than he is out wide like you're seeing a game this is a perfect opportunity for him to use his pace and running ability to 
run at the opposing defence and yet you've got them starting out wide. Played Boyle up front and that worked quite well because Boyle was able to stretch Kelly and also as well, it, it kind of meant that there was, and this is something I've seen off of Hibs quite a bit this season to be fair, is the interchanging between Campbell and Boyle was something that, that you've seen at bits as well, but it was just a bit more natural because Boyle's used to kind of going out there and, and staying out there, and so that made it a bit more fluid. One thing Hibs, well, they're still struggling to score goals. And also Dylan Venti looked a bit out of sorts. I think he's not a player who necessarily involves himself in games that much. He's a finisher. That's that's my take on it. I've not seen loads of him, but he's... Quality in front of goal is very good. Generally, like he's a very, it seems to me like he's a very, very good finisher. But he maybe doesn't get involved in the rest of the play as much as you would like. So that that's okay again if you've got the rest of the parts of that team. But it does mean they, they can be a man down at times, like they certain attacks at least. Right. Let us finish by talking about Livingston two Rangers nil. Tom. Yes. <laughs> um. Oh, as you as you bang, bang your it, phone, yes. <laughs> furious, at, furious at Livingston's uh, capitulation. That's me uh, furiously agreeing that yes, we shall go into Livingston Little Rangers too. Uh, a a a far a, a strange game in a way because it was both a far more dominant. Like if Rangers had won this six 0 that would not have been an unfair reflection on the way that the the game panned out. There were, I mean. They missed the penalty. They had two goals chalked off, one more controversially than the other, um, and certainly had the chances. But I think in a way it's the biggest mark of how much better than they are than they were under Michael Beale because playing exactly that same way they would have drawn this game six weeks ago. They would have con- contrived to have found a way that having missed a penalty and being a bit frustrated and missing a few chances they would have, have, have struggled to break Livy down. And Livy were, were, were pretty good defensively. I think it, one, of the most, one of the most interesting kind of tactical changes has been moving from the it Beals like three up front, three strikers. Um, it is, actually, there's, there, are, there were far more bodies forward with one striker, three behind, and the fullbacks and, you know, Tom Tom Lawrence and think had a had a particularly good game. Kind of all all coming in behind in support, and it was almost like if you've got the if you've got the bodies to hold the ball up and move it around and and be a bit more patient with it, then you can have support and you can have overloads, which is what ended up ended up happening. I I, I still think there are limitations, and I think the. You said that there's a title race on. I still think the limitations in that Ranger squad will mean there's not a title race on because I think still enough that they will drop points to slightly better teams than Livingston, who, you know, they defended doggedly but weren't very good, and still managed to kind of contrive to to somewhat become, uh, were involved in their own downfall, but. There's been a marked difference. Um, I think the, there's been a there's a bit more confidence to Rangers. There's a bit more swagger. There's a bit more expectancy that they're going to win, which is annoying when you're an opposition team because the, it, it it had started creeping. I mean, it, it, it's daft. He's only got like, Michael Beale's Rangers record's not that much worse <laughs> overall, but um, I think the difference in the the kind of mindset and the idea. It just looks like there's a little bit more savvy as to how to set up a team at that level. That to uh, to set up a team to to go and impose their will on a, on an opposition than there there has been a bit. But like all all in quite an entertaining game. I, don't, I didn't really watch much no, of this, so I'm just going to go you, to you, Craig. Yeah, I think I mean, Tom kind of covered most of it. Like Rangers, I think you said the title race. I don't think they'll win the league, but I think they will be. Much like the, the Celtic won't, it will be a procession to the title the way I think it was looking like it was going to be. Because I don't think this, I think you're right, Rangers will drop points. I don't think Celtic are, are amazing this season either, and I think they will drop more points. But 
Well, Rangers, it was like Livingston didn't lay a glove on them really in this game, and so that was it was made quite easy for them in a way that it usually. I, I say it usually isn't when they play against Livingston, but that's probably not actually been true for anyone either either them or Celtic against Livingston most of the time recently. But Livy well, just it was just quite passive, and they just weren't that involved in the game, and even like the kind of directness that you'd like to see from them that, that would maybe a rattle a Rangers team, it, it just wasn't getting them anywhere. There was just nothing. Nothing from they them. just got nothing at the yeah, moment. No, that's yeah. it. They're just they look completely bereft of. Yeah, nothing is the right word to describe yeah, Livingston like, right now. They've got nothing. They, so, they, they, the 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 architects of their downfall a bit, as you say, in the sense that the the penalty until the second penalty, yes, they are being pummeled or not being pummeled, but they're they're by far second best, but they're not out of the game. And then like Mikey Devlin waving his hand about above his, his head when a corner comes in. You can talk about a lot of contentious penalty design. We didn't really talk about I think the, the one Motherwell got at, um, at Fort Park. It is a penalty under the rules, but I hate that type of penalty. Because, yeah. But this one is just a penalty. It's just like, it doesn't matter what the handball rule is. If your hand is like waving about above your head and stops to cross, like, that's a penalty. That's always a penalty. But the... <laughs> Like, like, as you said, maybe if you, if you don't do something stupid like that, you know what can happen in a game of football. It just takes, like, a big punt up the park or something, you know, someone falling over or whatever it is. And they, they didn't even give themselves a chance in the game, having had the let-offs with the two disallowed goals and the let-off with the missed penalty, which, I mean, we, me and you will talk about, mm. never a penalty. Like, that first one is one of the worst decisions you'll see. I said exactly the same thing about the penalty Celtic got at Tynecastle a few weeks ago. Two of the worst penalty decisions I've ever seen, but this one, this one's worse. But yeah, the, the Rangers have got like I think Lauren's coming back. Me definitely, his, his assist for the Dessels goal is boiled a bit by the shitness of the finish. But like, oh, the the fact that it hits the goalkeeper and it like it kind of trickles in, but the assist is is really good and he might make a difference. But he's another one of these players you cannot rely on because very much of his Rangers career injured, and I think he had injury problems mm. before that. So. Good, enjoying while he's here, but he might then break down in four games' time. Well, one bright spot for Rangers, not just in this game, but of late, is Ross McCausland, who does look a very handy player. He was he was excellent. I mean, he he was incredibly direct. Yeah, the definitely took a dive for the penalty. I'm not having that it was anticipated contact. It was definitely a dive for the penalty, but... There was so many. All right, he's learning the dark arts at a young age. Learning the dark arts at a young age, exactly. That uh, an assist for Tavernier, as it's known. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he was he was so direct. He was able to like he, he was going to the byline. He was coming inside, and he was. It, it, it was difficult to too much to judge too much because Livingston were really passive, and they weren't even doing the kind of take some bodies and just see what happens if we start to put the fear of God into the young man with no facial hair. It, it, they, they didn't even have that. But every time he got the ball, you could sense that oh, there's something happening here. They're moving it. It's like, and, that, and that's been sorely missing. You know, at the tail end of Michael Beale's tenure, that guy was Scott Wright. And that guy was Scott Wright having told Scott Wright he didn't have a future. So it's a... Yeah, it, it feels like a, a a fairly significant find for the league, at least at league level. I think just bringing a young guy into the team is something for a manager, just, a new manager, just bring a guy in that's got a wee point to prove, and it's just like setting a tone of it. It's also saying to everyone at the club, like you've got a you've got a chance here, like keep working hard, etc. He's looked very good. It's always the case. Sometimes you get these young players that come in, have a few good games, and then fade away. But he's given himself a chance, and he'll be. Definitely in their thoughts now going forward, which I think is as much as, as you can really do. Right, I think that'll do us. All agreed? Yes. Yes. Right, thank you very much for it's listening. Like way to end the podcast, Craig. <laughs> well, just in case there's somebody else wanted oh, to I say object. something. I object. <laughs> Joel usually does. <laughs> Actually, I just wanted to usually note some stuff that he wants to get in. There's a game from three games ago I want to talk about this player. <laughs> So I just thought I'd check. And then you interrupted me saying thank you very much anyway. Yeah, so. Good, good. You need to finish podcasts as professionally as we started them. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you very much to everybody for listening. As I mentioned earlier, if you continue to like if you'd continue to like to hear from us, that's a great sentence there, Craig. 
If you'd like to hear more from us, please head over to the Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Terrace Podcast. As has been mentioned a couple of times, myself and Craig are going to talk through a few of the very contentious decisions that this really seemed like a lot happening in Scottish football this weekend. So we're going to do like a, a bumper edition of Ref Review for that one. But there's loads of other stuff that's going on, on the Patreon. We typically, well, it's certainly an average of five podcasts a week across the season. And to get access to all of them, it's just £5 a month. As I say numerous times, what can you get for a fiver these days, let alone a fiver a month? Don't think and tell them, because <laughs> I might, might spend the money <laughs> on that instead. That is, no, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, it's actually nothing. I've looked at it, it's nothing. Don't look yourself. All right, that'll do us. Tom, say goodbye. Goodbye. Craig, say goodbye. Bye. And I'm Craig Fowler, and I've just realised that I forgot. You can also watch us on YouTube, so do that as well. Goodbye. <laughs>